Hello and uh, welcome to the uh, Wilkin Chapman Business Solutions webinar, um, Clients in Trouble, Rescue Options After Furlough. Uh, my name is Chris Grocock, I'm a partner at Wilkin Chapman uh, Solicitors and also a director of uh, Wilkin Chapman Business Solutions, our insolvency practice. And today I'm joined by our uh, lead insolvency practitioner and director at Wilkin Chapman Business Solutions, Ian Rose and also uh, Matthew Dix, who's a partner at Wilkin Chapman Solicitors and also a licensed insolvency practitioner. So just as a quick rundown on what we're going to be looking at today, uh, we're going to look at the current position for SMEs in the, uh, in the UK economy, uh, some options for clients in difficulty, um, how the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act has, has changed things, and then a little look at uh, you know what we can do to save a company or the business in these difficult times, and finally a uh, quick look at uh, solvent liquidations, members' voluntary liquidations. Uh, for those uh, business owners are probably looking to to exit at the moment. Uh, we'll try and keep it moving and keep it interesting to make sure everybody's uh, uh, awake. So we'll we'll have a few uh, polls as we go along for a bit of interaction. And uh, also, uh, if you've got any questions, please post them up there and we'll uh, do the things as they go along and um, uh, at the end. First, we at uh, the current state of play. Uh, it seems to me that there's a, a myriad of challenges for UK businesses at the moment. Um, we've had businesses supported by furlough and other government intervention schemes for a long time. But uh, what do you think the current state of play is, Ian, for, uh, for UK business, SMEs? It's obviously very difficult and challenging times for everybody from every size of business and sole trader. I mean, basically, you've got lots and lots of support, as you've mentioned, from the government, but it still comes down to the individual companies and traders to keep their supply chain working and, and keeping their credits on board. Um, there's lots of challenges being faced by them, and it's all all new. No one could predict where we are, so it, it's it's horrible, really. So that's that's how, how we see it as a, as a, as, a, as a practice as you're aware. What we're, what we're trying to do is give people advice and, and guide them in to different options and, and ways forward. So it seems to me that there's probably, you know, we we know there's probably quite a lot of so-called zombie companies out there that are probably surviving on uh, government uh, support at the moment seems to me that the government supports probably trying to um is coming to an end now we've got the deferral schemes the the for, for tax and that probably looming in the distance mm -hmm. um you know are these schemes really just kicking things down the road is the is the trouble on the horizon i think i think there is i mean there's a lot of businesses that that, that are and were successful and will be successful in the future but the, everything that's happening now is just deferring potentially the inevitable of when the day of reckoning comes to have to pay it's all back either deferred deferred rent has been deferred and the loan the repayments that are going to be on the sea bills so and that you mentioned the tax and the VAT deferment so there's going to be a coming of day when when you can't either pay it and you need to look at some sort of advice and procedure to to rescue the business and the company or the end the end is there or, or they will get some funding and it will happen there's lots of different ways that it will affect businesses and they're all in a similar situation, but every business business is unique as to what what the options are and how it can can be dealt with. But there's lots of issues and there's lots of inevitable situations going to happen. It's just a case of when will that be and how much support can the government provide in the meantime. Yeah, I mean the, the furlough scheme. I think we'd all accept has been sort of a major success and has has been uh, you know the lifeline for for lots of companies and even helps a lot of profitable companies out through a difficult uh, period. Um, obviously, that's coming to a close, Matt. We're moving now to a situation where, at the end of this, at the end of October, uh, that scheme will be coming to a close. Um, the, the Chancellor was obviously under some sort of pressure to uh, to step in and do uh, and introduce something else. Uh, we've got the job support scheme. You know, is is that going to make a difference? Is is that sufficient to replace the furlough scheme? Yes, yeah, so this is uh, this was announced last Wednesday by the government, the uh, the job support scheme, uh, part of the winter economy plan uh, announced by the Chancellor around the same time as he shelved his uh, his autumn statement that had been expected. Um, in terms of whether it makes a difference, um, my gut feeling is that it, it will make a difference, but only in 
um, certain circumstances. Um, so as of today, we've got, um, according to the media, 3 million people um, on furlough across the economy. Um, some of those will be people that are not working at all. Um, and some will be people who are on the flexible furlough. Now, the, the job support scheme, uh, broadly, the, the fine details are still awaited, uh, will mean that your employee has to be back in work for um, a third of their, their usual hours, um, for which obviously the employer pays. Um, the employer pays a further third on top and the government pays a third. So where you've got that flexible furlough situation where businesses, um, where it merits having the employee back, then yes, I think the job support scheme will help out. Uh, but, um, you know, there are three million people on furlough at the moment. And I think the challenge will come for businesses um, where they have people not working at all and, and, and what the next steps there will be. Um, the, the key word from the Chancellor's sort of winter economy plan was viable um, and he, he, didn't, he didn't mess around in making it plain that the government support is now focused on those viable businesses. Um, so I think the government, the media are certainly talking about it. Um, government announcement yesterday about post-18 education and training. Um, yeah, again, media, uh, media rumours of a million uh, added on to the unemployment list and um, it's obviously you know, bad news all round but fundamentally the difficulty for some businesses it's a demand side issue where fundamentally those businesses are in sectors where the demand just isn't there um, and I think that's that's where the challenge is so so broadly I think yes it'll make a difference but I, I don't think it'll avoid uh, some of some of the challenges that are, that are coming down the line. Because one of the things I'd heard from a business owner on a radio was that, um, you know, the, the cost of effectively employing three people under the, the job support scheme, notwithstanding the, the support from the government, was actually more expensive than employing one person full time. So there's, there's obviously some calculations to be done there for all business owners, which, uh, you know, the number crunchers, our accountancy friends are probably going to have to help out with that to... To, to look at the merits of keeping those people people on. So one, one of, you know, the sectors that are most at risk, um, you know, what, what, what's your view on that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, again, it's something that's in the media a lot is which sectors are most impacted by uh, the pandemic. Um, and for me, it's, it's, you know, people throw around retail, uh, hospitality, catering, things like that. But the, for me, the, it's actually much wider than that because you need to look at the, the supply chain around those businesses. Um, so retail, obviously retail has been uh, suffering huge challenges for probably a year or two at least before the pandemic, obviously with the advent of, of internet shopping, Amazon, et cetera. Um, and so they were already operating on very thin margins, but linked to retail, you've got commercial property and landlords' interests. So further down the line, if the retail businesses are no longer there and viable, what's the commercial property sector gonna look like if you're a landlord holding a load of retail units? Are you able to repurpose them? And then thinking on commercial property a little bit further, um, you think about office space. Obviously, everybody, it's, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, there's a lot of noise around, you know, we don't need offices anymore. Well, I don't think that's quite right, but potentially further down the line, you've got a lot of change to come. Um, generally, businesses are going to be tied into a lease, so they're not in a position where they can quickly um, change a property strategy. But certainly medium to long term, um, there may be changes coming because the, the value of the commercial property uh, may not be there in future. So those other sectors, whilst you know they're not directly retail or catering, um, they can be hit with it. Um, yeah. you know, and, and it's everywhere because of the interconnectedness of all businesses now. Um, you know, a wedding company in this country can't really function as certainly as well as it used to. Um, and then you look as to what's in their supply chain. And you hear that the, the champagne producers have uh, put a cap on production this year. So all around the kind of the economy around those businesses is going to be hit by this. So it's just a question of thinking, how are those businesses linked to see the, the headline stuff is all in the media. But I think it's about going the next stage to see what uh, 
what what links to that business, what demand is there going to be from, from other sectors? I mean, the irony of it is in the insolvency sector, we're seeing less insolvencies uh, yeah. in August 2019, but that's probably a, a calm before the storm, I expect, an indication of the government's support. But let's, let's have a look at the first poll question then, just to try and keep people uh, interested. So... Um, Let's see what we've uh, got as the first poll question. Slight technical hitch there. We'll move, we'll move on for a minute. Obviously, uh, the, the technical department aren't quite up with us on there. Well, let, let's, let's have a look at, com at companies in difficulty, Ian. Um, yep. the, there obviously are looming storm clouds. What options are there out there for those businesses that were previously profitable and through, you know, no fault of their own due to the pandemic, they're now finding so themselves uh, struggling? Well, but basically, there's, there's quite a bit of, of, of solutions and options we can look at with individual companies and, and their friendly accountants, etc. going forward. I mean, from the government's point of view, there's a lot of support which is coming and winding down. Um, but what we need to look at is the changes to insolvency law, which will help as well. And one of them was the change to the moratorium, um, which previously was, was, was never really used. But I think will come into its fore going forward in the, in the near future, which gives, which gives companies a full window protection from its creditors on the basis that they um, file an application to court via the out-of-court procedure, and it gives them a four-week window which to... Um, put in some of the funding, uh, look at other ways of, of, of restructuring the business internally. And it means that in that four week period, no one can issue a petition to wind up or they can't go down the route of um, enforcing actions, etc. It gives the company the, the chance to properly restructure by way of coming out of it with a sol solid business going forward with a revised business plan. That um, scheme is monitored by an insolvency practitioner for the four week period. And as long as the company does what it says it will do and doesn't incur more debt, but doesn't pay off the old debt, it's, it's, it's not in breach of that moratorium. It will sit there for the four week period. It can then be extended by up to a further four weeks without creditor approval. And, and beyond that, creditors agree to the current process and how it's working and deemed to go forward. Obviously, there's a longer term. Um, solution need. We can look at what's called company bond arrangements. That's a formal plan to restructure the old debts, tell the company's creditors what's caused the problem, how they're going to get out of it, and what creditors will get as a return. Those can last anything from a few months to up to five years, with a dividend prospect of small pennies in the pound right up to underpaying the pound. It all depends on what the ability the company's got to pay into a CBA and what assets it's got uh, and what it's providing from those assets to its creditors. It's all on an individual basis. I mean, we've seen some of the big names go through a CBA and, and they are a viable rescue for, for businesses that are struggling. But again, it's, it's one, of, one of the tools that is on practice having their bag to, to talk to directors and their advising accountants on it, to give them a solution and a, a way to save the, the business and they come to the future. That's a bit of a, a brief insight into what we see. And obviously then you've got the, the ter terminal situation where there's a, a liquidation by way of a sale of the business assets to a third party. But that's just a, another option. So really you've got the moratorium and the CBA as a way to, to rescue and, and restructure in these difficult times. Yeah. So the CVA or the, the company voluntary arrangement, obviously we hear a lot about that in the media. I think the latest uh, rumour is Pizza Hut are next. Lots of the, the major retailers and restaurant chains seem to be using this, um, you know, possibly as a way to, you know, to, to batter down landlords on, on rent, uh, bear in mind the, the, the situation you're in. But, but, but uh, I suppose lots of our colleagues may not be familiar with CVAs uh, lower down the food chain, shall we say. So our, our CVAs, they're not just for large retailers then. No, you can do it from anything to, to, to it's a small retailer or, or small corner shop, etc. Right through to most of to anything, effectively. It's a case of, it's an ability to come to, together with your creditors and say, look, we can't do this. We have, we have a good business going forward. You just cannot, at the moment in time, pay this debt off. And there's a solution. So it, it covers any size of business. As against from as SME business that, that right through to the bigger ones. So... 
Because I think a lot of small business owners would probably look at that and just sort of pass it by thinking that, that can't be for me. But, you know, my own experience at uh, Wilkin Chant Business Solutions is that the vast majority of our, uh, if you like, clients are, are SMEs, smaller SMEs that, yeah. that, that can quite successfully complete. Just, just talk us through a little bit about how a CVA would work here. And, you know, what exactly is a CVA? Well, a CVA is, is, a, is an arrangement with well, the company says to its creditors, we can't pay you in full, or we can pay you in full, whatever the case may be. It puts forward a proposal which is a formal document, which tells the creditors how they've got into the situation, what they're going to do to get out of it, and what creditors will get us by way of a return. I mean, we've done, we've done hundreds of CVAs in the existence of us as, a, as an entity, and we have had some very good success stories where they've been paid, creditors come out on 100p in the pound, but at the end of the period, Credits have got what they're expecting to get, and it, it's worked. It, it, it's, it's a good tool for an RP to advise directors on because it can be a way of rescuing the business and the company and, and, and keep it as an entity for the future with the employment and the supply chain intact and, and, and people feeling that they've got the best they were going to get rather than liquidating it and getting potentially very small pennies in the pound back. So it has a place within the, the, the toolkit of an insolvency practitioner to advise companies and directors and, and their advising accountants etc on so a typical so example, at, the, at the moment a topical example might be um i don't know um a, a restaurant business um in cleethorpes let's say for example uh, they've probably struggled a bit at the start of lockdown then had the boost with um you know the eat out to help out scheme and, and now sadly are facing a long winter with shorter opening hours mm -hmm. um, that business that restaurant might be in the longer term a viable business because it's all be, always been profitable up to now yep. how, how would that sort of typically work for a for a cva would they be able to defer debt for a while what what you would do in a cva as long as credit has agreed to it you can do what you've put in there and then they've voted in favor of it so you could say can we have a a three or six month sort of payment break at the beginning with a view to starting them in March, the summertime of next year with a view to hopefully things getting a lot easier, but it, it would stop anybody presenting a petition for the historic debt or, or coming after the coming of those historic debts. It ring fences the old debt, says we'll, we'll, we'll pay as we go forward all our liabilities as they, as they arise. Um, in, the, in, the, in the meantime, and then come, say, March or the summer next year when times are better, we all hope, we can then start making contributions to, to, towards our creditors from the profits we're going to generate. As long as creditors agree to that, you can do what you want. What you can't do, you can't disenfranchise credits and treat them all differently. You've got to treat them fairly and they've got to agree to what you're putting forward as a plan of action. Yeah. So a contract with the creditors, basically. Yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. So who... If, if, how, as an insolvency practitioner, Ian, how would you go about assessing whether a, a, a proposal for a company voluntary arrangement was viable? You know, would it be worth putting forward to HMRC, for example, for consideration? How would you assess that? Well, HMRC have their own guidelines as to what they expect to, a proposal to do, etc. And there's, some of those are that, that your returns are up to date, as in you haven't just buried it and totally done nothing. As long as you've kept the revenue up to date with regards to your submission of back returns and returns, for corporation tax, etc., Whether they're paid or not isn't the deciding factor. It's the fact that you're compliant in regards to the legislation. So it's important to keep those returns being filed. If you can't pay, that's a different different, different matter. Mm -hmm. um, also that you've got no failed CVA in your, your history in respect of what you have or haven't achieved. And um, that, that you are putting forward a business plan that, that will succeed. That's HMRC's criteria. And since in most of the CVA we put forward, they are one of the biggest creditors. You have to make sure that you tick the right box from that point of view. But also, they haven't got to be commercial, whereas your normal trade creditors would look at it more, what, what's in it for me? HMRC don't always look at it, what's the net return? They look at how are they going to stop an offender re-offending and, and, and getting into problems in the future. That's more their, their remit, whereas normal trade creditors are looking into it. That is a problem as well. But they want to make sure they're going to get something back on their historic debt because they've obviously got their creditors to pay so it affects their supply network and chain etc but as i said any any cv has got to be viable you look at it from a, a cash flow point of view and a PL point of view to make sure that what you're putting forward is going to a be achievable it gives the best return the creditors can expect and it gives a better return they get if it's all going to liquidation because 
So no point working your socks off for five years in a CBA if an illiquidator is going to get a, a better return within a few months or, or, or 18 months, two years. So it's a case of making it more attractive and the creditors understand that you're, you're working to work with them, give them a better return, and hopefully they'll see that. And it's put forward with a report by an insolvency practitioner nominee to say we've looked at this and whilst we haven't done a full audit, we believe it's, it's achievable and has the best return possible for creditors. Thanks. Uh, Matt, um, Ian touched on liquidations there as sort of being the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the next option if, if uh, the business isn't viable. Um, it's hard to put a positive spin on liquidation, I think. Um, most people would see it as being the, the, the undertaker of the, uh, the business world. But are, are there any positives that a director can take from the, uh, the liquidation process? Yeah, yeah, and I think for the directors, um, they really have to take the positives. I mean, often we'll be dealing with the liquidation of a company that, that may well have been the director's life for a number of years. Um, so, I mean, on the positive side, potentially the director might have been trying to fend off creditors for some time, months, possibly years. Um, and the big positive in terms of creditors is that once they take that formal step of getting advice from us and, and make the decision to liquidate, we're there to deal with the creditors um, on behalf of the company to ensure that they're all treated fairly, as Ian just said. Um, it enables an organised wind down of the business. And yes, you know, there's no getting away from the fact that it, it ultimately ends with the dissolution of the company. Um, but it, it's also an opportunity for the director, a positive, to draw a line um, under the company uh, and look, look towards pastures new. Um, and I think that's where, where you need to be, um, where the director should be focusing, uh, for me. Um, in terms of the director's personal position, as well as positives to take from uh, early action, um, and that relates to um, potential personal liability further down the line for things like um, trading whilst insolvent uh, or misfeasance. The important thing from the director's point of view, obviously got a duty to the, to the company, uh, is to act if they get to the point where they consider we can't avoid insolvent liquidation then it's really important to get some early advice and take the necessary steps because of the potential for personal liability further down the line um, just on wrongful trading we had last Thursday government announcement of the extension of various coronavirus measures linked to insolvency um, but one of the things that they didn't extend, interestingly, was the wrongful trading suspension. Um, up until, I believe it expires today, there was a suspension of uh, wrongful trading offences. Um, they're, they're now, they are now um, a possibility for a director if he's been trading whilst insolvent. So again, you know, the director doesn't want personal liability. That's the whole point of having a limited company. Um, so you know, take the early advice and, 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 and get in touch. Yeah. So the, the, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act was trumpeted as, as uh, you know, been a major change to insolvency earlier this year and some of the things you've just touched on there leading on from that. So uh, how has is, how is the, uh, the Act changed things? Yeah, the Act, the act came in. It's, it, there's basically two types of measures in the Act. So on the one hand, you have some measures that have been anticipated for years, they've been widely consulted on. And on the other side, you had measures that were purely focused on um, coronavirus pandemic, basically. So one of the big ones was a, a, an, eff an effective ban on winding up petitions. So if you're a, a creditor business and owed money, um, at a practical level, you can't, you can't issue a winding up petition now. Technically, you could, but realistically, you're probably not going to. Last Thursday, the government announced an extension uh, of that ban on winding up petitions uh, through to the end of the year. Um, and that, that goes hand in hand with a ban on um, commercial property evictions, which the government had extended uh, the week before. Um, on the flip side, one of the big um, effects, and you touched on it earlier, Chris, is the effect on the corporate insolvency landscape across the economy. Because this year, um, we've seen a, a big drop in the number of formal insolvencies um, in the year to date. Because, because of the ban on uh, petitions, they exert a degree of pressure on the system, which will force a business to go and take advice. 
um, which, which could lead to liquidation of the under the winding up petition, or potentially it could lead to things like Ian was just talking about a CVA and turning things round uh, to get the business back on a solid footing. Um, other things that were in the I call it the CGA because it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, there's an exemption for small businesses in relation to termination clauses. So um, if a customer goes into insolvency, normally um, you're not allowed to exercise termination clauses in contracts. There's an exemption for small businesses that has been ex extended. Um, it's now to the end of March 2021. Um, I mentioned already the wrongful trading provisions that did come in and um, they've now been lifted um, and, a no, uh, and you know, wrongful trading is as of tomorrow will, will be a, a potential offence as well. Um, on the non-COVID side of the provisions you add two new um, tools basically in the insolvency practitioners toolkit that are available for companies to try and deal with the challenges they're facing. Um, so the, the first one is a restructuring plan and sort of a court based process uh, and the other one is a, is a moratorium uh, which is designed to allow breathing space for the company to be able to assess its options and you know, decide upon a good way forward that's got a real prospect of, of successfully navigating uh, you know, challenging times. So the, the moratoriums of interest, I think, Ian, you, you mentioned it uh, earlier on. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it sounds, sounds like, a, again, targeted at major restructuring. Um, I don't think we share that view, but, but is it targeted at larger companies? No, it's targeted at all, all SMEs, effectively, because it gives the ability to have the, the, the chance to, to, to look at your options without constantly looking over your shoulder as to which credit is going to come knocking at your door next or which bail is there, whatever's going to happen. It gives the ability to have some breathing space to look at collectively what, what you're going to do to make this a better operation going forward and get you out of the hole you're in because there's nothing worse than just bearing your head, carry on digging and, and, and making the situation worse in many respects. The, the moratorium itself is, 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 a, is an ability, and a, a legal ability, to, to stop creditors coming after a company whilst it gives due care and consideration to what it's going to do in the future. It's a very good window for any size of business to, to, to lodge the documents in court, um, get the four week period of, of, of some sort of stay whereby they can work with the instancy practitioners to make sure that they are profitable in that intervening period they pay their debts as they get full due in that period and, and they are not making the matter worse. But it does mean then they haven't got to pay off their historic debts during that four week window. And as I mentioned then, after that process, you can reapply to the court for an extension to that without the creditors being um, consulted, you advise them of that. And then if you need a further, you have to get creditors consent, but there'll need to be a valid reason for doing so because the creditor wants to know what's gonna happen. You're eight weeks into it already, what are we going to do now? Um, whereas four weeks gives you the ability to, to look at it and, and hopefully turn it around, but the extra four week extension may be the decider and it may result in the fact it doesn't be a liquidation, it doesn't need to think terminal. It can work with its creditors, whether by a, a restructuring plan, whether it be more investment from shareholders or stakeholders, or whether it's just the fact they go to the bank and the bank says, we, we have a further loan or defer some current loan repayment. It's, it's a case of what suits the business, but it gives them that chance of, of looking at it and, and saying, we're going to come out of this and our credits will get paid as a result of it. So the, mor the moratorium to, to, to me is uh, it needs to be supported by some type of plan, whatever that may be. So creditors yep. couldn't abuse it and just, uh, sorry, companies couldn't abuse it and just use it as a way of delaying payment. There needs to be a, uh, a plan in place and that's overseen by uh, the insolvency practitioner as monitor. That's correct. Yeah, the monitor has the ability to, to draw an end to that moratorium if he feels there's any abuse of process or anything happening that, that isn't supposed to be happening. Um, he has the ability to go to, to court himself and say, I'm declining to act and it should be rescinded. Um, and that would then draw a close to the moratorium. Um, he's, it, whilst he's not closely involved as a director level, he's closely involved in respect to monitoring what performance was expected to happen and therefore making sure what was expected to happen is actually happening and the creditor would have some support, their professional court-appointed party is looking at it from a dispassionate point of view. 
and it means whilst the directors are still in control, the the moratorium is being overseen by somebody who can see, yes, it's it's successfully achieved what's supposed to be done. There's a likely good outcome. But there is somebody there outside the directors and the current stakeholders looking at it and, and deciding that this is fit for person was doing what it said it would do. So just returning to uh, to rescue at the moment, because uh, obviously that's going to be uppermost in most uh, companies' minds and their, their uh, accountancy advisors uh, to try and keep those businesses um, trading uh, during the COVID period. And we don't know how long that's going to be, but certainly it looks like it's going to be through this winter. Uh, one of the things I've often heard you say, Ian, is, uh, you know, do you want to save the company or the business? What, what do you mean by that? Base, basically, with any, with any company, there's two entities. There's the actual legal entity being the company and the business that's behind the company. Um, a CV and a rescue would actually save both entities. It would save the company and the business. A, a liquidation can effectively save the business via some sort of buyback through the directors or a third party. So it saves the business as a core and moves it from the current company into another company by way of an acquisition, whether it be a sales invoice or a physical sale agreement depending on the value of assets in, 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 in question. But you save the assets by way of evaluation being done and, and a party would pay for those assets and move them from A to B. But the perfect rescue is one by where you rescue the company and the business, but they are two, within one entity, they are two separate sides to the, to, to, to the entity in question. That's what I mean by my comments. And I know we, we are bang on, bang, bang on about it quite a lot, but that's what I'm actually meaning referring to. Okay. Matt, um, we've talked a bit about liquidations from an insolvency perspective. Um, there'll be quite a few business owners who probably think, well, I've, I've had enough, I want to exit. So, you know, a solvent liquidation, a member's uh, voluntary liquidation, how does that differ from an insolvent creditor's voluntary liquidation? Yeah, so you've got MVL and CVL, um, and the key the key to the difference that you've already mentioned, Chris, is solvency, basically, um, and and where that sounds out is in who who controls the liquidation. So if if we're doing a member's uh, voluntary liquidation for the shareholders, ultimately they they've got the financial interest. You know the assets will be getting transferred to them, so they basically dictate uh, how the liquidation will run. Um, CVL, a creditor's voluntary liquidation, that's where the company is insolvent um, on either a, a cash flow or balance sheet basis. It can't pay its debts as they fall due. Um, and the way the insolvency law works is to, to give the creditors the ultimate control of the liquidation because at the end of the day, they've got the financial interest and they're the ones who are going to be losing out. So. There's some, there's some, a lot of similarities in terms of the entry into the liquid, both liquidations, as in it's, it's a director decision, then it's um, a shareholder resolution to liquidate and to appoint a liquidator. The difference with the creditors is that at once the shareholders have made their decision, matters are then put before the creditors so that they have the opportunity to, um, to make their feelings known, uh, basically. So essentially it is one of control. Um, who, who ultimately controls the liquidation. Okay. Well, there seems to be quite an interest in um, you know, solvent liquidations at the moment. I know we've seen quite a few flowing in over the last you know, couple of months. What, what's, what's, what's driving that? Is it business owners looking to, to, to effectively get out? Yeah, I, th I think that's driving uh, a part of it, Chris. Obviously, potentially you've got businesses that have been functioning fine over a number of years profitably all of a sudden the pandemic's come along um, and they're no longer profitable businesses so you've got the owners looking to exit the position wind down the company and effectively transfer the capital out of the business to themselves to realize the value of all the hard work over the years um, another aspect that's driving current interest um, is really probably government driven um, back in July, the Chancellor ordered an in, um, a review of CGT, capital gains tax, uh, and the reliefs that can apply to it. Now, often when we're looking at MVLs, solvent liquidations, really a lot of it boils down to tax. Um, so the relief available is 
business asset disposal relief, um, formerly known as entrepreneurs relief up to April this year. Um, Chancellor, this is all based on rumour. Um, the Chancellor announced his review and the rumours went along the lines that in the autumn statement, some of the reliefs will be reduced or removed completely and that that will have effect from uh, 1st of April next year. Now, here we are today, last week, the autumn statement's gone. We've got the winter economy plan. Whether these changes actually happen, we don't know. Um, but for the owners of the business, the potential to take advantage of that relief and reduce um, the tax on any gain from 20% down to 10% is obviously a huge incentive. Um, that relief is available now. So the advice would be, if, if you're thinking about it, then best to act quickly um, in case something changes on short notice. Things, I think, generally since the pandemic came along, things can change very quickly. Um, you know, a lot of stuff in the media, right? eventually the government's going to have to balance the books somehow and pay for um, all of the, the, the cash that's been flowing into the system. Um, and potentially this could be one of the options. Um, the government's got a track record of making changes to CGT. Um, the, the limit on lifetime gains was reduced back in March from 10 million down to 1 million. So they've already shown they're not, they're not afraid to, uh, to ring the changes on that front. So I think they're, they're probably those two things are, are what's driving the, the current interest, Chris. So oh, um, sounds a, a reasonably complex process, Matt, to uh, to to, to uh, run a, a, an MVL. Um, we see a lot of prices out there on the internet where insolvency practitioners are, are quoting quite low fees, nine hundred pounds plus back for an MVL, which you know sort of staggers me slightly. But is it possible to do an MVL for that sort of price? Uh, well. Anything's possible, Chris. Uh, I think the, the question is whether or not you can do it at that price and make a profit is, is probably a, a tougher a tougher question to answer. I mean, look, you know, there's no secret. If you Google MVL prices, you'll get a whole host of uh, very, very cheap prices. Um, I suppose from my perspective, it's really about what you're paying for and what what the job involves potentially. Uh, MVLs are basically at the very core about distributing the assets of the company uh, up to the shareholders and then the company is dissolved. Where the job can become more complex is when the liquidator after appointment has a lot of stuff to do, put in very simple terms. And this, this comes down to the balance sheet. Um, if you have a company where the only asset is, is purely cash, all the creditors have been paid, no other liabilities, so that in theory, when the liquidator's appointed, all he has to do is distribute the cash to the shareholders, then obviously that's a, that's a, fairly, a fairly easy task. Um, experience tells me that MVLs generally are not like that. And often when we um, first engage with the accountants and the businesses, we have a look at the balance sheet and there's, there's matters on there that we need to tidy up is the phrase that we use pre-liquidation so that the cost of the liquidation can be kept as cheap as possible. Um, I think, I think the, the sort of bargain prices on the internet, I think for anybody um, going for them, they need to be clear about what they're paying for and also what they're not paying for. Um, and the core th thing to think about is assets and liabilities. And what does the balance sheet look like? So if there's, if there's creditors claims and we go into liquidation, then me as the liquidator, I have to pay creditors claims. The law says I have to pay 8% on creditors claims as well. Now, if you've got perhaps a, a significant um, debt to HMRC, the last thing the shareholder wants is to be giving 8% um, 8 per annum extra to HMRC. Um, so it's, it's those kind of issues that we need to look at when we're talking uh, about MVLs. Same for assets. If it's a cash asset, obviously very easy to distribute. Um, if we're dealing with some other form of asset, could be anything, could be land. Then if we're having to go through the realisation, valuation, a sale process to turn it into cash, then that all takes more time and that's, that's where it um, sounds out in the cost. 
I mean, I think, I think for me, the bottom line is sort of you, you, you get what you pay for, um, but also if something sounds too good to be true, then it, it may well be. So I think tread carefully and just make sure you're clear on, on what you're getting for your, uh, whatever fee you agree with the insolvency practitioner. Good. Okay. Thanks for that, Matt. Thanks, Ian. Um, hopefully that's been uh, useful for you uh, watching over this uh, lunchtime period. Obviously, I think there's some challenges ahead for all our clients. Uh, most of our clients are SME type businesses. Um, and I think probably most of our audience are, are in that market as well. Um, serious challenges ahead. Um, hopefully we're there to support our clients and help them through it. Um, for those of you that need insolvency support, Ian and Matt and I are, are, are always available. Uh, please get in touch and we'll do what we can to help. But for now, um, I hope you've enjoyed today's uh, webinar and we'll hopefully see you again soon. Goodbye.